group here to uh, Amsterdam, my first visit to Amsterdam, so I'm excited. And uh, thank you, Andre, for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, since I um, understand that this section could be as long as 90 minutes, uh, my plan is, can you hear? Uh, my plan is to, has three sections. I probably will read those sections and then stop after each one. I don't know where you're all, where you all are at, thinking wise. So I'm just doing my thing. So I'll stop after the first one, just to see if we need to orient each other to what's happening. And I would appreciate even questions like, what, <laughs> what did you just say? <laughs> you know, or what does that mean? Or anything that you would like, we won't go on for long periods in those breaks because then we'll have a fuller discussion at the end. The last section on the unconscious is, to my mind, the more interesting part of the paper, so uh, to get there. And in some sense, um, it may be the unconscious of the selfie, I'd, I think. Uh, I'm now calling it the user unconscious and um, not the non-human, but you'll see. So, if I may, the f there is three topics and they're related. The first will be about bodily affect, measure, neuroscience and philosophy. The second will be about effective measure in digital technologies. And the third will be on social media and the cerebral unconscious, the non-human unconscious or what I want to call the user unconscious. Okay, so let me begin. One, affect, measure, neuroscience, and philosophy. There is something very important about what the neurosciences have taught us about the brain. Even though evidence, not infrequently, points to the failure rather than the success of the neurosciences to realize their most spectacular claims about the brain, including the mirror neurons. The neuroscientific study of the brain, I want to suggest, is important nonetheless. But this is because it gives us an example of the relationship of affect and measure. After all, and uh, I could say computation, calculation. After all, in what is the canonical text on affect, Brian Masumi, argue that affect, or the capacity to affect and be affected, is a bodily responsiveness without consciousness or cognition, or before consciousness and cognition, a bodily response. Masumi drew on the neurologist Benjamin Liebet, whose experiments showed brain activity occurring before consciousness registered a stimulus, a stimuli. Brain activity before consciousness registered a stimuli. More specifically, Liebert showed that there is a half second delay between the nervous system's response to stimuli and that response being consciously registered. Something like we feel pain a half a second before we say ouch. Or the body feels before it knows that or what it feels. Francisco Varela, the biologist and neuroscientist, also would discuss affect in terms of the neural dynamics that connect affect to the flux of time. Referring to the half second delay before the nervous system's response to stimuli becomes cognized or conscious, Varela would describe what is happening in that half second. There is, he proposed, an assemblaging of a host of competing distributed neural processes from out of which a stabilization emerges that, however, is always emergent and intrinsically unstable. Varela concludes the relevant brain processes necessary for cognitive activity to go on are not only distributed in space, coming together, but they are also distributed 
in an expanse of time that cannot be compressed beyond a half second, the time for the integration of elementary events. So before the nervous system responds, there's an activity that takes time. This fraction of a second, this impossible timing of the present in the passing of time, registered neurophysiologically, is the half second of brain activity before a subject becomes conscious of a stimuli that Masumi also points to. Varela goes on to treat this fraction of a second in which the self organization of elementary events occurs as a matter of affect, arguing that implicated in this fraction of a second of organizing is affect's very nature as tendency, a pulsion, a motion that as such can only deploy itself in time and thus as time. In case you're not getting the impact of that, it means that the nervous system has a half second of indeterminacy before it responds. So it's no input output here. There's something that goes on between input and output, always important. In both cases, it's important to notice that the so-called effective turn that seemingly brought us back to the body or more precisely to neurobiology depends on affect being known or materialize through measure. In the case of Masumi, it is the Liebert measurement or visualization of brain activity. And in the case of Varela, it is the measure of self-organizing elementary events in neural processes that take time. And notice the word self-organizing, these happen without consciousness. We're not organizing. It's self-organizing. Affect invites measure, or what I want to call a technical expansion, whether that be narrative or poetry or dance or the measure of digital technologies, the one I'm interested in here today. What this means for affect is that affect is never merely biological or neurophysiological. Rather, it is a medium, the opening in the body to a technical expansion. It is as a pulsive force that affect is a medium, or to put it another way, affect is an effective medium. It makes something happen. It is the passage of time in which the body is indeterminate and as such open to technical expansion that moves the body from the biological to the worldly as really as part of biology. We might call this openness in the body, this indeterminacy, an originary technicity, a medium that is within us. So when you say you can feel affect, like I feel my heart pumping, my hands sweating when I'm about to take an exam or give this talk, you are speaking phenomenologically or talking about your consciousness of affect but the sweating hands are already also part of a measuring of affect. So if I say, wow, I'm really nervous, my hands are dripping with sweat, you're speaking in terms of measure again, speaking to a more intense affect. Affect is only known as measured, but I'm emphasizing the non-phenomenological measures of digital technology, not your consciousness, but something that's happening that digital technology can join without our consciousness that have allowed us to see the infrascale of affect like the brain imaging of neurobiology. But for the most part, affect studies did not at first focus on measure. It did not take measure as an issue in itself. Rather, it took measure for granted and turned instead to philosophy equating the half-second delay with virtuality, Deleuze's virtuality, or indeterminacy imminent to the body's ontology, drawing on Deleuze, Whitehead, and James. Without focusing on measure nonetheless, this turn to philosophy was important and gave us a new sense of the body 
as having the capacity to affect and be affected before consciousness or cognition. So for critical theorists, affect turned us to thinking about the body as dynamic, but not as a matter of social construction or discursive construction, as Judith Butler had proposed. It wasn't because culture gave the body meaning or that the body was inserted into social practices. Rather, the body was thought to be itself ontologically dynamic or lively. Its ontology was taken to be ontogenetic. What the body is, is its ongoing becoming. Or the body can change on its own propulsion. Now, the reason these ideas about the body and affect went viral in intellectual circles is because the effective turn arrived on the intellectual scene or the philosophical scene after there had been a great deal of critical thinking about the privilege of the sovereign subject of Western thought that Andre mentioned, the white male hetero propertyed abled bodied subject who was assumed, even if not named, in the way Western thought or philosophy took up rationality, reason, science, mind over matter, mind over body, matter, objectivity over subjectivity, reason over emotionality. The turn to affect was a further liberation from this way of thinking about the subject, the rational subject, that had already been challenged with the conception of the unconscious mind or the irrationality of the mind offered by psychoanalysis, now was challenged by the body being as much a participant as the mind is in cognizing and becoming conscious. Affect not only is prior to consciousness and cognition, but is a necessary precondition of both. And so affect challenges the sovereign subject without carrying much of the meta narrative density of psychoanalysis. The point I want to make is that when we turn to brain studies, it is important to see how the philosophy of affect that took off from measure once again meets up with measure, brain imaging, et cetera, especially the digital measure of affect or the non-phenomenological measure of affect like brain imaging. What this means is that brain studies are not a matter of reducing mind to biology or neurobiology at the expense of culture or sociality especially if we consider that the technical expansion of brain studies are expansions of the indeterminacy of the body its own medium within, or at least they can be that. It's the technical expansion of affect, which is an indeterminacy in the body, a medium within. It's originary technicity. So there is no fall of the body or human nature into technology. We are of an originary technicity. Neither nature nor technicity are originary or both are. So when I said the body is ontologically ontogenetic, that it changes by its own pulsion or affect, I could have said the same thing about the brain. Instead, this is what brain studies has proposed. Indeed, I'm sorry, not instead. Indeed, this is what brain studies has proposed in pointing to the plasticity of the brain, that the brain can change and continues to change throughout life, affected as it is by its environment. It is the plasticity of the brain that has led Catherine Malibu to speak of the auto-affection of the brain, or the brain's experience of itself, its sense of itself changing. She goes on to argue that the auto-affection of the brain is not, however, a conscious experience of the human subject. We cannot feel our brain changing, but our brain can feel itself changing. The brain's auto-affection 
is an experience prior to or beyond consciousness and thus made aesthetically accessible to the human subject with the assistance of digital technology or a technical expansion, for example, brain imaging, the same brain imaging that was central to theorizing affect in the first place. Now, this technology is very interesting. It both shows us the brain and also can be used aesthetically to uh, impact that uh, what we see of the brain. So it sort of opens up access to it while it's also changing it. Very interesting kind of measure, and I do want to talk about that. The brain's auto affair. So before turning to topic number two on effective measure and digital technologies, let me open to questions and discussion this first time by summing up. Whether it is a matter of the human body or the embodied brain and nervous system, affect is always inseparable from measure, both from the phenomenological, conscious of affect, and the non-phenomenological perspectives. This suggests that affect is never just about a single body or a single brain, leading to ideas like the collective head, as Andre put it, or the distributed brain, as Andy Clark might put it, but these collectivities are not just of human actants, but also of other than human actants in technical expansions. This is what I mean by measuring. So no collective head without technology. Thus, the te without technicity, because we can talk about different kinds of technologies. Thus, the turn to affect gave the body or the embodied brain a place center stage in many fields of study that focus on practice, on movement, on the arts, media studies, science studies, without always noting the place of measure or measuring technologies or technical expansion in these fields. But if we think of a musical score, a choreographic design, performance art, and their relationship to number or quantities, we might want to think more about measure and digital technologies, which is what I will do next. But let me take some questions or comments before I go on. I don't know if you're already ready to ask, but just to be sure, you know. Yes, I can't quite see you as well as you can see me. Yeah, I'm, I'm also very interested in, in, in uh, Varela's uh, work and, and um, Who? I'm sorry. Uh, Varela and, yes, and yes. The, the, the measuring of the, of the uh, delay. Uh, uh, I, think, I think it's not always a half a second, but, but it's I'm point, sure. yeah, point <laughs> 0.102, 0 0.50 milliseconds. Um, but but um, the, the issue I have with the notion of affect is that it's a very broad category. And so I'm wondering about interpolation, about ideology, about culture, and how in that delay, that is when culture enters. That's when interpolation enters. That's when um, the, the subject identifies itself as subject. Uh, and so, yeah, so the word affect is such a broad category for me that it becomes a bit difficult. Great. Uh, is there any other one that might happen? Just to be sure. Okay. Um, that's a great question. And uh, already the complication, the heart of the complication in some way. And I um, welcome that question because when I say originary technicity, which would maybe take a bit to explain uh, about the body, uh, about the body, about the skin and the creation of skin in, in the infant's touching itself. I could go on about that and should, Myrtle Ponty, blah, 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 but I won't. But that's already a medium that constitutes an inside and an outside. And the skin remains an inside and the outside. And when we're talking about the body as organism, when you were speaking, Andre, we have to think that we, the body can exfoliate itself out into the environment because it's a, an originary medium. It's of its biological nature, I would like to say, to be able to move from inside to outside, from, from biology to the world or to the social. So 
I don't want to put the social out there coming in to us, but to see the social already as part of the indeterminacy of the biology, that that is social, that is culture. Now at other uh, scales of consciousness, we think of it differently. That's when we start thinking it's outside coming in. And to some extent from you know the, the higher, we could say higher level of consciousness than all living things have consciousness, but not that higher level one, if we want to call it higher, that from that level, we might think of culture coming, but what's really happening, it's a technical expansion and intensification that already belongs to the body. Now, what we could do with affect is blah, 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 blah. so, but I don't know what else to do, you know, uh, what words we have to use. I'm, a, you know, I'm going to tell you that there's subjectivity up and down through all of the universe, and there's, really, should we use that word? You know, because Whitehead uses that word, why? Because uh, I think a lot of times we use some words to startle ourselves from how we used to use them, and so affect was very interesting to use at first, and now it's all over the place. But I hope that the question, not answering so much about the specificity of affect, but my point about uh, not thinking uh, that the body or the brain um, is not a biology that has indeterminacy to it. What I want to talk about next is how even measure has indeterminacy to it. So I hope you're satisfied enough. And one more, yeah. The mental form, actually. Excuse, uh, you have. Uh, yes, yes. Th this is also a good question. I, this, this is why it's good to stop, right? I mean, I know I'm clear, but <laughs> I may not be with you. And so um, there, what the measure is, is interesting to me, not because I believe it, you know, not because it's giving us something in itself. It's more to step back from some of our common understandings about biology or neurophysiology, right? Because, uh, but what's being measured according to them is the half second or maybe less between what can be seen as brain activity before we become conscious. But what's really important to me is that in the last 20 years, all the philosophy, all the writing about affect, so much so that we don't know what the word means, has leaned on that measure. That has been its basis, even though we didn't maybe know what that meant exactly. So when you say, what is being measured? Well, for Varela, which is really very interesting, and I was a student of his teacher, Maturana, and is that the, the nervous system has to bring things together in order to respond. Even before we become conscious, there's something indeterminate, social and cultural, not determined in the nervous system itself. There's time in the nervous system. We always like to know there's time, because that means it's possible to change how we respond. So there's politics there. And it's, it's a great thing to understand rather than being uh, too afraid of some of these things, although there's plenty of reason to be afraid, as you can imagine, because we're technically expanding something that's not conscious. So we want to think ideology and manipulation politically. Well, we must. I mean, uh, that's where we're going. I mean, digital technology is expanding things that we are not conscious, and that's pretty scary. If you're in the United States right now, we're getting a very special version of it. <laughs> Trump. Right. Yes, but, but I, I want to say something about that later. So uh, I'll go on, because I'm just going to say more of the same, probably, in another way. Affective measure and digital technologies. Uh, this one is maybe the least pleasurable. I love it though, because I love this stuff, but you might not. <laughs> now, to get us closer to the idea of effective measure, not measuring affect, but effective measure, and digital technologies, I want to explore with you the way performativity is implicated in thinking about measure and affect. I already said 
that the effective brought us to a body and a brain that always are becoming. That's what we learned. Their ontology is indeterminate, always becoming determinate, at least temporarily. So if something is measured or determined, then that is the end of it, it's indeterminacy. So if something is measured or determined, then that is the end of its indeterminacy, yes? Well, no. Not if indeterminacy is ontologically what something is. Then indeterminacy is always part of it, before and even after it is measured. So if we say that affect is indeterminacy ontologically, that means that's what it is and always is what it is. So even if it's measured, it remains indeterminate. The way Masumi talked about it is that affect um, is a virtuality and its realization never exhausts its virtuality. It's an ontological argument, so almost have to go with it. Something is, that is always part of it is that This led affect theorists to argue that affect, when measured, is always in excess of its measure. Affect can't be fully captured. So even when one becomes conscious of the effective response to stimuli, there still is affect in the body after consciousness, just as there is before consciousness. But of course, it would not just be the same intensity. We can think of noting an anxious response just making us more anxious. I'm getting anxious, I feel anxious, it's getting more anxious. And nothing's really changing but our own response to the anxiety. So it is better to conceive of measuring affect as a matter of modulating affect, making it more or less intense, expanded or contracted. Measure in this sense becomes a matter of modulation, not reduction, a matter of measure as performance or incitement to movement to do something. When we perform, we want to affect, and we want that affect to make a difference, a notable or measured, measurable difference. Now this may not be news for those in the arts and performance, but the larger implication of affect studies has been to profoundly transform all measure, to think of measure itself as transformative. So too, we can think of a technical expansion as becoming part of the body becoming, the part of anything becoming. So let me just explain that a little bit because as I said, it would be a little more abstract. If you measure something that's lively, you capture it, but you don't end it. So it remains lively. What that's made us understand is that measure doesn't really measure this is a thing and then you measure it. That measure modulates. It moves, we could, what I'm doing right now is sort of measuring. And the measure constantly produces more of the thing or maybe less of the thing. I could be now making what your confusion was two minutes ago, I hope, lessen by modulating my affect on you. But this also opened up questions of how science measures, what mathematics is doing. And I will spend a minute telling you about how algorithms are not our measurements that modulate and change within themselves so that measure itself has become very interesting. That's why we're in the age of computation and calculation and algorithms and you can see where I'm going, I hope. Part of what drew me to thinking about this was the idea that the turn to affect in academic circles seemed to coincide with the circulation of affect in areas outside academic circles, notably in governance and economy, where circulation of affect had become central given the digital technologies of the internet, social media, and computational technologies, like those operating in surveillance and control, and of course, big data, utilized in advertising and marketing, policing and war. All have become central to modulating affect or the mood of the market on one hand, 
on governance and those governed on the other hand. In terms of the economy, just think the emotionally sensitive financial markets around the world, psychological and their responses, the way they are affected and affect, and they're all about measure, a modulating measure. The mood of individuals and populations and the ongoing mood of the market itself. In terms of governance, think of the affect of governance and those governed the affect of various populations, the Trump election and administration, the immigrant issues in Europe and the US, and your own recent election. I'm pointing to the way effective capacity is at play in both economy and governance, which is the reason to keep thinking critically about affect and its measure, its technical expansion. So I even want us to think about measure in its quantitative form as a matter of modulating. We might more easily recognize that qualitative measure like performance of the arts are modulating, and we embrace this, but we might also be allergic, as I think maybe Andre was this morning, allergic to quantitative measures and think these are reductive, or if modulating, they're modulating us without our awareness. And of course, increasingly, we are up against quantitative measure that modulate us without our awareness, working as they do on non-conscious affect. We even choose to be modulated, Fitbit and other quantified self-measuring devices. And these are only the tip of the measuring machine, which recently Ben Bratton referred to as the stack, by which he meant an accidental megastructure of planetary computing that vertically stacks layers of cloud computing, ubiquitous computing, massive addressing systems, human and other than human users that are actants in data processing at every layer. Serious stuff about measure there, right? The stack is conceptual framing, but it also is an empirical mapping of a political geography. It's computational sovereignty, as it's called these days, challenges the political geography of nation states, but by no means simply marking the demise of the nation states, which actually is more entrenched and ubiquitous than ever, as it, but more than ever obsolete and brittle. What is that issue in any case? is that many scales of computing that the stack interiorizes and vertically arranges, which allow it to take over some of the functions of the state and the work of governance. The state and governance are being redesigned in the image of the stack as the identity of the user is becoming central to its operation at every layer of computing. As various layers of computing bind polities to themselves, let us say a school, a city, a police force, molecules of energy, the arts, as they get bound to computational mechanisms, these polities address every actant as a user, making being a user what counts. Be sure you understand here that the user is not the human user only, or even primarily. Because one of the big changes in technology is machines talking to machines. So when you ask Siri something, she, or it, or whatever, is a matter of one machine talking to another machine and like that. So that's a, a rather new phenomena that they can search other kinds of searches and come up with an answer. Right? But sure you understand that the user here is not a human user only or even primarily. Most of the actants or users are at every scale of computing where humans are far removed from the activity, like the non-phenomenological measure we've been talking about. Before we pause for discussion, let me tell you why I want to put center stage the user, user as an assemblage of human and other than human actants. With me? The user in any one of the layers of computing is an assemblage of human 
and other than human actants. We are living at a time when we have become aware both of the limits of human consciousness and human cognition and human rationality, not only in terms of unconscious desire and non-conscious affect, but also in terms of the privilege Western thought has given to the sovereign subject, as I already suggested and has already been mentioned. So we're aware that we've been decentering and deprivileging the human, but that has allowed us also to see non-human actants. In this awareness, the other than human user or actant is being recognized, not only as I am doing here in terms of digital technologies, but also in terms of environment, non-human animals, even things and objects, all becoming recognized as more lively, more dynamic than Western thought has allowed as it treats the other than human either as inert or lesser than human, is usually linguistically lesser. You know, that's our claim that we speak. But to be clear, we are now more aware of the many other than human actants in the universe, partly because of digitized tracking and sensing devices that bring data of the world to us through what Mark Hansen has called the datification of environmentality itself, or what Bratton has called planetary computing, calling into being a dormant potential for a direct experiencing of worldly sensibility. The worldly sensibility fed forward to our consciousness by datification. So when you get the message that your heart beats too fast, or when the apparatus on your body notices your sugar count and actually delivers medication to you without even knowing what's going on. You can think of that as part of the world sensibility. First, uh, pressing down on us before we even have affect or consciousness. And by worldly sensibility, I mean there is so much stuff going on in this room airways, for us to be able to hear each other, talk to each other, and we are technically expanding it enormously, lights, heat, air, but it's all moving, and it's all being picked up nowadays through sensing and tracking, tracking devices, not just here, but all the way out to the edges of the earth and universe, right? Coming to us in big data. It's part, actually, of our sensibility about climate change, about environment concerns. We are concerned about technology hurting these things, and we know about all these things only through technology. We're at that strange intersection. The worldly sensibility fed forward to our consciousness by datification can give us a sense of ourselves in a much larger context. But this larger context is also a matter of technologies or the quantification of computational technologies, including algorithms that can do what humans can't do. But what this means is that we must become partners with the very technologies we have created to do mostly what we can't do, and which also means that they can and do modulate us at non-conscious or unconscious scales, producing what Catherine Hales has called the traumas of code, by which she means the traumas of what is felt but not known, even as code makes it possible for us to reconnect digitally to what is felt and not known, non-conscious affect, paradoxical, Becoming partners with these technologies, I believe, is a very important vocation for the arts, to which I will return. But first, I want to announce our next topic discussion, where I will develop the notion of the user unconscious, mindful that this is not only a human user, but an other than human user as well. So before turning to that, Let's see what you made out of that. <laughs> Be brave. Yes, braves. Yes? Oh, you're waiting for the mic. Thank you for your talk. 
Um, I was just wondering about um, you. You speak of measurements and the indeterminacy in measurements, uh, but uh, it's just mainly because it's related to uh, my own research. But I was just wondering why uh, you choose to omit the word feedback or I, I, it, it, it seems to me that feedback it's really about all these feedback me mechanisms and you say that measurement is indeterminate and it's it can increase or decrease effect and uh, I was just wondering why you chose measurement over something like feedback or I, I have never have not heard you say the term bef before yeah. so I was just wondering if it was a deliberate move not to speak of feedback or mm -hmm. um, who's feed what's feeding back to what um, Give me just what's on your mind when you think who's, what's the feedback from and to? It can, for me it can be anything, um, but you, a measurement, you have a measurement, uh, and when you speak of measurement and its effect of uh, increasing or decreasing effect of it being indeterminate. Are you thinking of feedback to a human? Well, not necessarily, it can be pre-conscious or non-conscious okay. uh, or right. conscious. Yeah. It, so um, I'm n n not sure how to answer you exactly, but um, first let me say I was talking just briefly in the last few minutes of feeding forward. I don't know if you heard that expression, feed forward. Because the data from the universe is coming to us and consciousness lags it. So it's feeding forward to us, not feeding back. Now this is also a question I thought in part about where does consciousness come back in in terms of feeding back to the, to the brain and to the body in the way it responds, because there is a feedback loop. That's what it means to say that the brain is plastic, that it changes with the environment feeding back. So um, um, there's, we now have a new thing, feed forward and feedback. So I, I'm not sure I like the word feed forward. It doesn't give me enough weirdness. Like I'm trying to be very, I think trying to talk about measure the way I'm talking about is weirder. And I also am not sure that you are not talking about, and this is why I stayed away from the ideology at first, because um, I'm not interested in, in the part where we become perceptive and conscious. I want to stay in the world and in the domain of the non-conscious. And maybe feedback then would maybe, the loop would have to be spoken about when you're going to go from the pre-conscious to conscious and then maybe back to the pre-conscious. Why? Because I'm more interested in thinking of affect without it being just in the human body. Did you hear where I ended, for instance? I want to think of affect in an algorithm. I want to think of affect in matter. Now we probably, as you said, we could do feedback loops there too, but I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure I've thought it all the way through of where the indeterminacy is in a feedback loop. So it's a good question, but I think you're thinking of something becoming conscious and perceptive, which of course we do, but I'm trying to stay in the domain of, uh, of affect to expand it beyond the body into matter. But I think, I, I, I don't think I can, I think you, I, I hope we can sort of think we're saying something close. It's not a word I've thought enough about, so I can't jump in. So I can't say, oh no, I don't want to use that word because I know why I don't want to use it. Uh, you know, I'm sorry about that. Because <laughs> maybe I don't want to use it, I just don't know why I don't want to use it. <laughs> you might, uh, if I just ask also a question. Yeah. Um, Following up with the feedback, I was just oh, yeah. thinking about anxiety and um, measure, yeah. um, and maybe it's an example, maybe it's a silly example, but uh, when you when you say measure, I keep thinking about mismeasure and mm -hmm. mismeasurement, um, and in thinking about feedback Good. and, and si anxiety and politics, I was thinking about the New York Times three months before the election in New York, in the United States. At least the web version of the New York Times had this daily pulse taking of the nation yeah. in which you have like this percentage uh, this, uh, the percentage in which Hillary Clinton uh, will certainly win the election so it's a kind of reassuring uh, feedback loop actually it was a mm -hmm. feedback that made me feel always better <laughs> 
because it was always between 90% and 98% until the director of the <laughs> FBI yeah. sent that letter, it went down to 83%, but we're still feeling in the feedback loop of the affect, affective measure of that which is indeterminate, which is the electoral result, yeah. we are okay, right? And all, but all of a sudden, something We're has been okay. mismeasured, yeah, right? Mismeasured. So there was something that the indeterminacy was still there. So I'm just thinking like yeah, this, great. Whether, I mean, whether the right actually was feeding forward. They were feeding and the, forward. And the, and, the, and the left was like feeding back to yes. itself to feel okay, yes. that things will be okay. I mean, um, because I speak so often about measure, this is something that everyone always asks me. But see, they were wrong. I, I, I'm not, first let me say, and then I'll do the, the content of your remark. I'm not interested, no, I don't think what I'm talking about requires a notion of correct or incorrect measure. And you're making that point, even though you want to call it mismeasure, because it's modulation. And that's the world where you were modulated to feel okay. And for all we know, we don't know what the right was modulated when they saw that. Maybe they knew all along that they were working on another level. I mean, what, I mean, what shall we say? I mean, I, I, I think with Trump and the tweeting and that we have really, that we're not in some weird moment. We're experiencing politics in the very fast modulating measure. That's what he's doing all the time. Very quick modulating of measure, a measure that modulates us, constantly moving us. It's like, it's, be, it's almost like a mirror back on the technology. And it's not something weird. He's actually the first, in a sense, to know what we're all doing all day long, in a sense, tweeting and being inside the measure. You're inside, that's why you can be modulated. Be careful to not think here, because you can, but it's not exactly what I'm getting at. Oh, the statistics were wrong. Because they were wrong, yes. But the statistics out there are not the measure you're talking about, and that is the one that modulated you into feeling more comfortable. Because we know statistics change by the minute. Algorithms change by the minute. The market changes even faster than that. So we can pretend that that was a stable measure and feel better, but it, it isn't. It's a, it's a large measure compared to this, the micro level of measure that I'm talking about, right? But it's, it's, a, it's a great one of, of the mood. And the notion of taking the pulse of the nation is bizarrely strange, isn't it? So any, any other, like, um, anything that you're thinking that can't go with this? Are you, anything that's blocking the thinking that you're, you're okay? Yes. Sorry, I have to use the mic. I just, uh, okay. I wondered if you could kind of translate for me or like in other words, say what modulate means, because I'm- Oh good, yeah. Don't know. Um, you use it a lot. <laughs> you what? You use it a lot, so. Yeah, because, you know, we usually think of measure, uh, if you take a ruler. One of the things that's important about measure is that you think if I measure this, it'll be the same if I measure that, right? So if this, this is this long, and if I measure that one, that's long. So we think of measure as objective and sort of outside the measuring apparatus. But we've begun to understand at the micro level of effect, or even atoms, or um, uh, quantum physics is a great example, you know, wave or particle. It depends, the, the very thing is, is, the measure of the thing is part of it. It's part of what it is, right? And what it's becoming in a sense. I say modulate to emphasize that it's not like the ruler that it's a measure of something alive, and so to do anything to it modulates that thing, that the measuring makes it different, makes it change. That's really not the way we want to think about measure usually, right? Are, are you understanding? So, so we're talking about a world of calculation 
and computation in digital technology all over the, all the uh, uh, all the scales of the universe where things are alive part of what we're understanding about the non-human that it isn't inert but lively and therefore its measure is modulating it not just being able to do so in some sense the measures unit changes with each measure very dynamic so I can say like an example of an algorithm now. Algorithms are of course um, um, designed by humans, but they are designed to operate to change their, um, their parameters as they move along. So no, computer scientists will tell you that when the algorithm comes to an end, they don't really know what went on to get to that end. They can start it off, but the algorithm has the capacity or the indeterminacy to actually change its parameters. That's why they work at such high speeds. And they can work at such high speeds also mean they can attach to those half second delays and extend them. Because that's a matter of speed actually, you know, or quickness. Because we're at a very slow time, you know, like 73 years or something like that. You know, our, and things are going at very fast time and they're in us and they're outside of us and some of the in ones are much more connected with the out ones than our big self is right so when we feel cold or sweaty that's not our conscious self really something but the world is affecting us before our consciousness or other than our consciousness is that a little help yes thank you very much thank you that's a good question yes yes are you, oh, you're waiting. I never know why people don't answer my yes except you're waiting for Hi. the microphone. Thanks for, for your talk. I have just a question. You talk about um, universe and um, data. Um, um, about what about um, the word informatic? I mean, because you talk about um, algorithm, you talk about um, yeah. uh, measurement, but you never talk. I mean, is it meant to be... Um, uh, I'm sorry, the last part, I was uh, Informatic. Uh, Informatic. Why you don't talk about this word specifically? Because how, how do you do algorithm without informatic? For sure. Thanks. Um, I'm, you know, I'm trying to do only little pieces here. Yeah. So, um, sure. I mean, in uh, any longer work here would include information theory and thermodynamics. I mean, there's a lot we could do in terms of um, the, um, the universe is information or energy. You know. Not information like content. You know, we use that word colloquially. And you know, when Shannon Weaver uh, did the information theory, I forget who it was, one of the others said, um, Shannon didn't know what to call it. He said, oh, use information. Nobody knows what that means. That's a good word. And you know, it's, it's simply an equation, but it's, it's a thermodynamic equation, actually, which is interesting. You know, thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but in a closed system. Because the reason I mentioned that is it gives you a good sense of, thank you for this question, that the kind of measure I'm talking about is um, 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 a measure that comes out of information theory that is really just energy, matter energy. So it reminds you that we've always been matter energy. We're, nothing is inert. Everything is really energy and information. So it is a play with, it is an extension of information theory. And uh, a lot of affect theorists have gone back to work through information theory. Because information theory was in molecules moving and heat, I mean, it's great. It's a great question, thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, all right, so, uh, one more. Yeah, so I'd like to add to what you just said and ask whether you could basically just replace the word measure with modeling because... No. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, <laughs> well, in this context, I noticed one quote which it's okay. everybody in modeling uses, that every model is a lie, it's just... Matter every model is what? Every model is a lie because if it were as complex as the real thing, yes. you wouldn't need the model anymore. Yes, 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 yes. 
yes, 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 yes. I'll go for it because it's time, running out of time, but let's go back to it. Because that must be some of your language, right? Modeling here in the room? No? Why not? Yeah, I could do it. Yep. Okay, three. In her recent work on social media, Wendy Chun, while focused on those sites that human users inhabit, nonetheless treats the human user as a you, Y-O-U the you of YouTube, that is, as a figure that collapses the individual and the statistical aggregate of its affiliations. You know, our, 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 um, all the links and connections to our name and every time you press the button and all the information that goes out about you. Um, the figure collapses the individual and the statistical aggregate of its affiliations into a node in a network or more precisely, an indeterminate multitude of relations of nodes and edges. Network theory. Chun is imagining consciousness and bodily-based perception, or the I, as assembled with statistical aggregate of affiliations, that is, the you. As Chun sees it, what is most notable about the yous, Y-O-U-S, is that they are subjected to and subjects of social media, where the separation of the private and the public spheres has been displaced by the separation of the personal and the networked in the wake of neoliberalism's contraction and massive dissemination of privacy. However, as the separation of the personal and the network is more imagined than actual, even as it is extended only to some as their privilege, use privacy actually has become entangled with publicity, where yous are prone, if not invited, to be caught in public acting privately. In doing so, yous, Chan proposes, become the shameable and hateable, lovable subjects of the shameless sociality of social media. Selfies. One of Chun's examples is Amanda Todd, the 15-year-old who had flashed for an admirer online and then was online blackmailed. That is, the exposing photo was sent to a porn site and then to classmates and more. After becoming depressed, having panic attacks, and using drugs and alcohol, Todd committed suicide. But long before doing so, she took to YouTube and using handwritten note cards as her means of communicating, Todd gave witness to her self-abuse, the drinking and the drugs, caused by the blackmailer's abuse and the abuse of those who blamed her for having become a victim in the first place. Although some responded positively, even sanctifying Todd as an angel. This way of communicating on YouTube is not new and for some time has been linked to the template of various coming out stories as an epistemology of the closet became an epistemology of outing that blames and shames the closeted victim and increasingly the outed victim as well. Now what Chun does with this example is very interesting. She argues that while Amanda Todd was abused because of the information that was leaked and circulated about her as well as what she circulated about herself, for Chun, it is not just the information that Todd is punished for. It is the leakage itself, or Todd's thinking that communi communicating online is private, believing it's private. There is an embrace of this privacy that is also a denial of the network of which any users always, always a part. In other words, there is a transgression of the separation of the personal and the network that isn't really a separation. As Chun puts it, the user and her habits of leaking are blamed for systemic vulnerabilities glossing over the ways in which our promiscuous machines routinely work through an alleged leaking that undermines the separation of the personal and the network. So the whole system is meant to leak it's very important to think about politics today. 
Chun argues that this habit, both of embracing and denying the fact that online communication is not private, is the productive non-conscious of digital media. What we feel, but we don't know. It is this non-conscious of digital media that I want to refer to as the user unconscious. In order to point to the activity of the unconscious in the collapse of the personal and the network, and in the sense, the collapse of the inner and the outer of the human user, or the extension of unconscious processes beyond the body to the user unconscious, that is the unconscious of a you, or the unconscious of an I and its indeterminate multitude of relations of nodes and edges, including other than human users. So human and other than human users in one and that unconscious. That is to say, with the user unconscious, unconscious processes are no longer simply of the individual human subject if they ever were. They also are of a worldly sensibility and as such also play a part in the way humans are in relationship not only with other humans, but with other than human agencies, objects, things, and environments. Thinking, just a little more, thinking about the user unconscious might return us to the recognition among some few psychoanalysts that the human's early relationship to what the psychoanalyst Harold Searles described as the liveliness of the non-human environment never fully comes to an end. Drawing on Searles, Sue Grand even has proposed that if the psyche comes into being in relationship to human others, so it comes into being in relationship to the non-human world. Perhaps we all have a nascent thing self, she says. For Grand, the thing self state, often linked to traumatic experience, can also be a resource for positive, cosmological, even ecstatic experience. So often we can think of somebody be feeling like a thing comes from trauma, but she's sort of turning that around. Even when she does treat traumatic experience, particularly in relationship to sexual abuse, Grand, while proposing that abuse undoes the psychic skin, like you can't defend yourself, you're all out, nonetheless refuses to think the skinned body, the contained body, or the body one with itself as a matter of sanity. Instead, she points to the contingency of the bodies being there or not in relationship to the eye, and goes on to speculate that perhaps the eye feeling can contract and expand to include or exclude the body, or the body can contract or expand to include or exclude the eye. Perhaps we have something like a non-human mental ego contracted in relationship to the non-human and generative of both anxiety and centeredness. Or perhaps the user unconscious takes the body beyond itself, beyond its skin, to a world skin that is itself affecting or self-measuring. In this sense, we might think of digital media and computational technologies as eliciting the user's thing self state, or, grand, or what Grand also referred to as it-it relationship, giving shape to the user unconscious beyond the I to the you. I'm sure the notion of a thing state in it or, and an it-it relationship might raise some discomfort. I think that it points in one way to the increased awareness of the liveliness of things and to our relationship to that liveliness. And on the other hand, to the inhuman, where at the extremes, many live in near unlivable conditions, where their lives and their environment are made profoundly precarious. In the latter case of the inhuman, Catherine Malibu has argued there has been a collapse of the differentiation of organic trauma and sociopolitical trauma. Those traumatized by war, captivity, occupation, or sexual abuse, she proposes, show similar behavior to those suffering from brain lesions. That is, they are affected neurobiologically, or effectively 
their very selfhood is transformed. This is a matter of extreme relational violence or when psychic blows are stripped of all justification, of all signification. They're like psychic blows that belong to the age of affect. In these terms, the ends of humanity may well be its inhumanity, but still not without potentiality, indeterminacy, or a chance for another genre of humanity to come forth, as Sylvia Winter would put it. The thing self-state, after all, also can be a source of positive, cosmological, even ecstatic experience, pointing to a different way for us to be both human and not. I think we must tread this fine line between the inhuman and giving a proper recognition to the other than human actants, to things, self-states, and the it-it relationship. To conclude, in seeing you as a wounded subject, who also is the scapegoat for the leakiness of digital media, Chun wants to be able to recognize the potential in the you's desire expressed in the note card videos to become part of a community, albeit one of the shamed. The potential Chun has proposed is in the reminder which the you offers that the individual is a singular plural, to use the term Chun has borrowed from Jean-Luc Nancy. As subjects are constituted as singular through the plurality of others, including other than human others, the community that might be realized among yous and which would not be based only in shame is what Chun described as an originary multiplicity. And I like the resonance with originary technicity, which is not represented by society, but rather through writing, says Chun. Again, drawing on non C and slanting writing towards the digital, Chun proposed that writing is not so much about meaning, but a communication seeking nothing but an originary multiplicity in an operative we. That's an, an operative in John luc Nancy's terms. Along with the use, there must be this we, a matter of what the digital artist and theorist Jordan Crandall describes as subjects, not only human subjects, but all subjects who solicit one another, act upon one another, recruit one another, harness and channel one another's transmissions. They are agency of one another. They extend and consolidate. They attune to the sensory, rhythmic, and atmospheric exchanges that compose them. Subjects are constituted in a teeming vibratory instantaneity. They are excessive, beyond themselves, impersonal, rendered public and precarious, not at the center, neither primary nor alone. The substrate of which I am proposing is the user unconscious. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have five more minutes for final questions or questions Good. for the third half, and then we take a little break, and then we come back yeah, at 12.30. So um, questions, please. That last part went past, I'm sure, but yes. <laughs> Have you read the Li Bei book, or did you just read the, um, uh, the Brian Masumi? Parts Masumi? of the studies, yeah. Because, you know, I, I've always wondered about that Brian Masumi idea. Because uh, Li Bei, uh, in that book, is basically talking about finger tapping. He's basically doing a finger tapping experiment. He just finger taps, and then he sees, of course, in yeah. the premotor cortex, before the motor cortex, and the, the, the time differential you're talking about is the relationship between the premotor and the motor cortex, right. which has nothing to do with the emotional brain, by the way. And I just have always wondered how he made all these incredible comments I, about, yeah. about affect and, and about the getting in the middle of rationality, when first of all, finger tapping is not rational, it's just all you're doing is finger tapping. And uh, he makes just all these generalizations. I just don't understand. Yeah. Maybe you do. Um, no, I, I'm not doing that. Um, uh, Brian Masumi uh, was the example of someone who philosophized 
off of that. I mean, everything, he thought about it and left behind uh, the discussion of measure. So I was trying to return to the question of measure. Any other? I, 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 is there a question behind that? There's some thinking going on over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, just a comment. I was, I was thinking when you mentioned um, energy matter um, and the question of delay, I was thinking how in Batai, actually, mm -hmm. when he's thinking about energy and he associates to the notion of a cursed share, yeah. right? That every living organism has more energy than it actually needs to survive <laughs> simply, yeah. right? And that surplus of energy, this kind of excess of being, if you want, uh, or, or indeterminacy yeah. is actually the legacy that we have to deal with in yeah. relationship to action. So right. I'm just thinking in terms of agency and action in the, in the realm of <laughs> ontologically indeterminate mm -hmm. well, modulations. Yeah, I think we, what to do in relationship to action. Yeah. I think that uh, first I would say that the excess that, you, that Bataille speaks of is to my mind now understood as worldly sensibility of which we are part, not standing over or above. So to keep on speaking of the excess of the organism, we can do better than that in a sense. We can now see that, that we are open to the energies of the universe, the sensibilities, the self-sensing of the universe, right? I'm, I'm interested in um, wondering if anyone if I may, has a question on the third part, because it's my favorite part, and I know it came at the end, but I, so I was, I was hoping to get another stab at it, because um, I think it's really important for us to also think that, um, that, and it even goes to the question about measure that, that, that you raised, that there's perhaps an unconscious to what is becoming us completely enmeshed in technology, walking around as technical beings, which I think we are. I mean, it comes with mobile, and we'll even be more in smart cities, smart rooms. I mean, so much that might not happen, might happen, might be awful, we might not want to happen, but the idea of it might require that we think of something like the unconscious newly, that it isn't just the relationship between the hum the consciousness and the organic body, which, you know, Freud, when you brought up that quote from Freud, it's fantastic, because he went back to the organism and closed down the telecommunication, because he was so afraid of it, mm -hmm. what it could mean, and how an analyst and patient actually might be experiencing something like that. So I would like to think about the unconscious to include um, the the not the other than human actants that might become really part of our own sense of ourselves. I'm not sure we're there yet, but are getting there. And well, and, and, and and action then, you know, we don't want to think of action. I know you don't want to think about action. It's simply rational. So. When we've used to talk about desire, I'm not sure we would talk about desire that same way in my user unconscious. Maybe, I, you know, I'm just beginning to try to think that out. May I just add something? Because uh, yes, please. Because of uh, Lija Clark, when she escapes the regime of art and s starts to get to the end, to the, to the therapy, in which Sully Holnik, uh, yeah. you know, actually says, this is the moment actually that she finds art, <laughs> finally. Um, uh, I was thinking that two things. One is that for her, the unconscious is a drooling. So you dro it's something that drooling. leaks, it yeah. drools, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a vomiting, it's yeah. a drooling. Um, and in her therapeutic practice, actually, the technicity was actually, or the techne, the technology yeah. or the apparatus was brought by the patient. So a patient would bring an object and said, this object is my father's skin. <laughs> Let's deal with it, right? And this would be like so, so and she would incorporate that, yeah. right? So the question is simply, if the unconscious then now has a new formation, as you say, yeah. like what happens to psychoanalysis, what happens to therapy? How do you deal with your patients? That's my... Well, I, I'm really struggling with this as a psychoanalyst. 
I mean, I remember these remarks now that you're reminding me of it. Of course, the whole, you know, I'm really interested in digital technology, but do understand that we could be talking about the room, the couch, you know, those are all technicities in a sense. And so, but I think there's something to really challenge psychoanalysis with here. And that will come, and it's beginning, uh, to come with the practice that is on Skype, or I mean, that actually is using phones or um, reading text or texting. But I, I'm thinking more than that, like what is the nature of the unconscious? Is it like mother and father and that history? Or is it about some relationship with technologies that I don't think analysts yet, if you're not thinking that, you won't draw that from the patient. You know, and the patient says, I dreamt about a horse. You know that's their father, right? Why? You don't. You just, that's been the history of the training, so to speak. But it might be something else. And more and more, I see patients that are very uninterested of symbolizing. They can talk and they're smart and they can even tell you about what's wrong with them better than you can. But they can't like deal with something else going on in their bodies and in their environment. And we, there are body therapies that are good, but they're excellent. But there should be a way to create a language that comes closer maybe and doesn't demand it being put into that meta narrative of that history, of the generational history. Because timing is different, I think, for many patients. And, and now I must go with it. I think one I have to. Question. One, there's one, one question. question. <laughs> yeah, can I ask? Um, could you, sorry, I didn't catch the name of the theorist that you said, Grand? Or? Sue Grand. Sue Grand. Psychoanalyst, such an interesting paper. Where are you? Uh, right up the back here. Oh, there you are. Um, yes. Uh, must I start? What do you okay. want to know? Um, yes, about that point. Do you, are you saying that, uh, or she's saying um, that that idea of the relation of the eye to the body as being kind of flexible, that the eye can yes. expand to the body yes. from or back yes. that way, that that used to be thought of as being a response to trauma, but actually you're you're suggesting that's a skill that we should uh, encourage in ourselves. And how is that going to work out for, because there was another thing earlier that I didn't say, when you were saying about, oh, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, that, and then you started talking about that is a moment of modulation. You started speaking about modulation at that point. Yes. Could you connect those two things? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Couldn't I? Um, I'm not sure I want to say develop the capacity, but I think we are developing the capacity. So if you start with originary technicity and you don't think of human beings falling into technology like some sin, which is how we think of it often, um, th then you, um, um, I lost my train of thought just there, I'm so sorry. Just went away. Uh, well, then you might think of, okay, then you might think of that, that that's uh, happening to us in our relationship to technology. That we are, the te oh, I know what I want to say, I'm so sorry. That we are, I just got off the plane. Uh, that, that we are not disembodied by technology. We're embodied differently. And that's a big point to make because most people think that we're disembodied by technology. And, and lots of people want to you know, put your brain up online or something. So if we're not disembodied by technology but embodied differently, that difference might be that the eye and the body don't have to be all unified as one. And when we critique the self-same body or the self-same subject, it can also mean something we don't like to think about so much, that the body can put the eye down or not, or the eye can put the body down or not. It's not intentional, though, but it's a capacity I think we're developing by being online so much. And so I think we have to think about it and wonder about it and make art about it. So because it isn't conscious, it's unconscious, but a different kind of unconscious. And it has a lot to do with, I think she hit upon it, on the notion of the skin or the psychic skin, that we're skinned, our skin encloses us, 
but in our computer, we might be able to actually move into the computer past our skin. And it's teaching us about how to be not on the body. And yes, trauma has been like that, that the trauma is in the body, but we can't be cognitive of what happened. And so we usually think of that as terribly troublesome, and it is terribly troublesome. And what's happening on computers might be terribly troublesome too. But I think it's not just traumatic, because it also may allow us to feel one with the cosmology, a cosmos, not just our bodies. You know, our eye could be larger than our body eye. And modulation there would be that, a modulation that begins with the body being technically extended. Okay? I'm doing theme, so I don't know if you're going, uh-huh, uh-huh, or not, no, no. Okay. Um, I'd be glad to answer any questions during the day, because we should stop. Uh, no, thank you so much, thank Patricia. You.